Come on in. <laughs> Welcome, Metal Mythos faithful, to a very special edition of Metal Mythos Aftershock. For those who are unaware of the premise of the program, in editing a Mythos video, several facts generally come into focus. One, bands have a shitload of albums. Uh, two, even as a lifelong fan of said bands, it's an agonizing amount of research. And three, in the age of the internet, not all of the information you research will be correct. As such, it necessitated a kind of postscript to Metal Mythos, wherein I interview the actual members of the bands themselves, get their side of the story, and hopefully correct any factual errors I may have made along the way. The name of that series is Metal Mythos. Aftershock. It's an in-depth interview series to cover the career of metal's most important figures and correct any and all misconceptions we may encounter along the way. And there is no one better to correct misconceptions about not one, but at least two metal mythos luminaries than Rick Fox, who is both a founding member of Wasp and a founding member of Steeler, the band that famously launched the career of both Ron Keel and a young Yngwie Malmsteen, Cannot thank you enough for joining me, Rick. Thanks for having me on, Rach. I have to correct you there on your second one. Um, I'm not a, actually a founding member yeah, of Steeler. I actually realized that as I said it. You joined, <laughs> yeah, you joined after the fact. So we're already off to a roaring start. <laughs> <laughs> there's, the, there's the theory in practice. <laughs> right. I guess we'll start from the beginning here. To quote uh, Fred McMurray in Double Indemnity, all native Californians are from Iowa. But uh, you are ac uh, yeah. you're actually from the opposite end of the country, correct? Uh, getting your start in, correct, yeah. in, in New York in the rock scene there. Yeah, yeah. I was born in Amityville actually, but I grew up in Brooklyn, Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Peter Chris's family moved in around the corner from me, and I wound up dating one of his sisters. And this is well, he was uh, I think it was in between bands. He had just finished with Chelsea, and he had put an ad in Rolling Stone and or Village Voice newspapers and got the gig with uh, Gene and Paul, and, and they didn't have a name yet, but we were going up there to watch them rehearse, and some weeks went by, and we went up there to watch them again, and, and Ace Fraley was already in the band. Nice. Uh, is it true you photographed the band that would be Kiss? Yes. Uh, there was a club in Queens called the Coventry, which I, I got some pictures of them there. I did their uh, promo show that they did at, uh, at the Fillmore East, which was the coming out promo press thing that uh, Neil Bogart put on. And, and it wasn't, they really weren't calling it the Fillmore East, but everybody knew that's what the building was. And, and uh, so I got some pictures from there. And uh, Ken Sharp, author Ken Sharp, was very kind uh, to interview me and, and to, you know, get some of my uh, anecdotes and memories and, and the photos and put both of those from those gigs uh, in his book, uh, uh, Nothing to Lose, The Making of Kiss, 1972 to 1975. So uh, there's been a great oversight from many of the Kiss authors over the decades who, I guess, just didn't do enough research and, and knew that I was one of the people in that small elite circle watching the nucleus of KISS form from the ground up. And subsequently, I was not in many of those books in, in, in the histories of KISS until Ken Sharp came along and said, well, I'm here to, to correct that oversight. And and I thank him, you know, to this day for, for having me in there like that. And I gave him, of course, permission to use my pictures and whatnot. Right. You know, and, and uh, whenever he'd ask me a question on something and I'd answer it, then usually like one of the band members would, in the book would come after me to clarify or elaborate further on what I was what I was saying there. So when I make a comment or an anecdote, then Gene or Paul would say something after that and like that. And then Ross Radley has a book coming out, uh, uh, Kiss Magic or Magic of Kiss or something. Um, and again, I, I've uh, given my permission to use some of my pictures in that book as well. I mean, I guess I have to ask how you were inculcated into rock in general. I, I, I don't know, looking at the bands you were in, am, am I correct in assuming maybe Alice Cooper was a bit of an influence? Well, for sure, definitely. Yeah. It was an influence. So, well, you know, I figure in high school, I was I, 1970, 1970 through 74, it was high school. So, you know, 73, 70, 71, 72, 73 was a really golden era of hard rock bands that were coming out. You know, Cooper being one of them, Humble Pie, Spooky Tooth, Deep Purple, you know, a lot, a lot of stuff. Sir Lord Baltimore, a lot of people don't know about them. They're, they're from Brooklyn. Yeah. And the guys that I went to high school with were friends with some of those guys. So I was getting turned on to a lot of this stuff. It must have been a curious scene because you're around the sort of nascent version of Kiss. So we're like mid-70s, right? That must have been kind of a weird 
vibe because hard rock and heavy metal were being essentially killed off by the emergence of punk. Um, was that sort of an impetus for relocating to Los Angeles, or what, what happened there? Not really. Um, uh, how do I put this? Uh, well, you know, I, I and through with being being exposed to Kiss, and then of course the clubs and whatnot. Um, until I was old enough to actually legally get in the clubs, you know, I fabricated fake IDs and I, I had the camera, you know, and I would show up at the clubs. I'm here to shoot the bands, take the pictures, blah blah blah, like that. So I'd get in. You know, and and I shot uh, uh, pictures of this band and that band. You know, we played Coventry and whatnot, and and uh, you know, and plus, uh, the crowd dressed up like the bands. There was no thing the concept called poser. Nobody looked at somebody who wasn't in the band and, and dressed up and called them something derogatory. It was all accepted. You know, if you dressed up just like the bands, you were accepted as far as being part of the scene you were a supporter of the scene so right. i got satin pants and lurex shirts and I had platform shoes platform boots and i would go to these these gigs and you know yeah, i'd get in i'd take the i'd shoot the pictures take you know like that I, I i hung out one night with a couple of guys from the new york dolls uh, at coventry mm-hmm. like that jerry nolan who was one of peter peter chris's best friends uh, Jerry was the drummer in the Dolls, you know, like that, you know. So, mm-hmm. so that that's what was going on there. Seventy-five, I was introduced to one of the the most coolest clubs ever, was Max's Kansas City. It used to be an art club, and a whole art crowd, you know, Andy Warhol's crowd, though, that whole scene. And eventually, musicians started to hang out: John Lennon, Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Alice Cooper, um, bands like Springsteen and Bob Marley, uh, Aerosmith. All these bands were starting to play there and get signed out of these clubs. Out of this club, it became this whole underground New York underground rock scene, and punk started to come in at that point as well. And then, of course, uh, downtown, a little further away from Max's, was the you know inevitably was the legendary CBGBs. Right. So, uh, so I got introduced to a guitar player from a, a, one of the bands that played Max's. Uh, he goes by the name of Sebi Castle back then, but now it's Sebastian Black. He's a, a psychic medium, ma- magician kind of guy. Okay. And um, and he was looking to replace his bass player, so I got introduced to him. We started talking, and and I'm looking up at the stage, and there's. You know, a very young Debbie Harry singing back up with some other girl for somebody else's band. You know, this is before she was Blondie, you know, like that. And right. and uh, I wound up getting the position. I joined what was uh, was called the Martian Rock Band. And this was now my first foray into theatrical rock, you know, uh, in person, doing it myself. You know, I'm being closely influenced by Kiss and Gene and those guys and, and the makeup and all. And, so, you know, the Martian Rock Band didn't really have much of a spacey kind of an image. It was very uh, elementary level stuff. So I started experimenting with some makeup ideas like that. And, and uh, uh, each member of the band was uh, in a line of, of the song, the opening song, Take, Take Me to Your Leader, Go Figure. Uh, each member of the band was introduced and where what planet or where he was from. And he said, just happened to be the, the, the lyrics with the bass player, he's from Mercury. So wow. now I have to go home and figure out, okay, what am I going to look like? And I put all this this whole costuming idea together, and I I, I just kind of blended across between Gene and Ace. So you know I had like uh, green greenish sparkly skin. Uh, I had the eyebrows like Spock. Um, <laughs> um, I I drew scales on my chest wherever my skin was exposed, so that gave it kind of a lizard thing, lizard look wow. like that. And I I put a few drops of green food coloring on my tongue, so now my inside of my mouth was green. And oh, and that's uh, great. So, 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 you know, Sebastian used to shoot uh, a fire out of the end of his headstock on his flying V. Oh, you gotta love it! So, you gotta love yeah, it. Yeah. So the uh, outer space sci-fi theme and everything. Any any sort of Bowie influence there, or you know, I, I know that was up and coming at the time. It's it sounds like a pre a pre Klaus Nomi kind of thing, but with rock, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, that's a good question, and you bring up a very good point. You know. Uh, and some of the pictures of me with with my hair the way it was done, uh, people have said, "Yeah, you look a very very zig- Ziggy Stardust in these pictures." You know, yeah, uh, because we, we were using streak and tips, the, the silver in our our hair, and making streaks and things, streaks and tips, things like that. Yeah, you know, and, like that. So yeah, it definitely did have some aspect of a Ziggy Stardust type uh, impression to it as well. But you know, we were harder rock. The music was like right fifties fifties doo wop meets punk meets space so so 70s 
Stephanie called it. We were we said we were a spunk band, so <laughs> I just take it at that. You were also around the Jersey scene, uh, correct? With a band called uh, well, what became Sin? What what yeah, sort of music yeah. was that? Was that pretty much the same kind of? Uh, thing musically or you know would would i be correct in suspecting you probably ran into twisted sister and the misfits around that time not the misfits but i did see the original lineup of twisted sister at, at a club that i played at in, in jersey called the red fox inn okay this was before d snyder this was original lineup uh, like that there was a, a a clothing store i worked on and in, in the west village uh, um, on 8th street which was a few doors down from Electric Lady Studios. And in walks this guitar player with his girlfriend or wife, whatever. And, and you know, I obviously looked like I was in a band, and we struck up a conversation. And, and he said, hey, you know, I'm in a band out in Jersey. Uh, and this, this band was called Virgin. This was the original Virgin, not the California Virgin. This is like, we're, we're talking 1970s. Six-ish. They had their picture in Rock Scene magazine. You know, they were they were a Jersey glam band. So what they were doing was all the best of the British glam invasion, plus Alice Cooper and Kiss, and it was Bowie and Mata Hoople and uh, like that. You know, it was, it was that, that whole uh, uh, genre. Uh-huh. And it was makeup and platforms and shagged hair and the whole the whole spit. You know, we didn't have big hair back then. It was called you know shagged. Or so we played the Jersey club circuit like that and eventually members replaced blah 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 virgin became lust for a couple of weeks and then from lust for like one show i think we were called swan and then after that i around 1977 uh i came up with the name sin we we competed against bands like twisted sister and and the the, the jersey version of twisted sister because twisted was long island band the jersey version was a band called harlow and okay. and they were they were the shit as far as glam bands they were they were the band you had to aspire because Harlow played everywhere. They were the, the the hometown favorites in Jersey. So we were like we were like Harlow Junior. We we all got along. We were great. We hung out. You know, there was no backstabbing competition. There's none of that plastic crap like when I came to California. So yeah. like that, and and I played the Jersey clubs. You know, and that was uh, that's how Sin was born. Interesting. I, so it seems like it was going pretty good. Um, it would wind up kind of reemerging later, but I'm curious how that ended and how you found yourself in Los Angeles. Seen at that point, uh, I think by '78, I want to say later '78, maybe summer '78, the singer got a, a better paying gig playing drums in another cover band. Oh, okay. So I was I was out of out of playing for a while, like I said. So I was working in the clubs, still in the scene, active, just working in the clubs. By 1980. I got a phone call from another. Uh, I did not. We were huge, but they were pretty large and popular uh, club. Jersey, not back to Jersey clubs. It was a group called the E Walker Band, and yeah. and you know essentially these bands are like a live version of a jukebox. We played everything from Joe Jackson to Judas Priest, punk, classic rock, Doors, Zeppelin, you know Who, Ramones. We did everything, and that was my day job, cash money. You know, six nights a week, four or five sets a night. And I did that for about a year and a half. Chemistry was getting weird. I was number seven out of eight bass players in that band. So wow, yeah, you were like there. you were like drummers in Spinal Tap. Goodness. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good analogy. Here's this weird six degree of separation thing. I became friends. My the girl I was going out with at the time became friends with the girlfriend of this guitar player, uh, David Ferrara. David was one of the, the 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 guitar player. Mike Varney had just the producer. Mike Varney had just had shrapnel records and was put out a series of albums of, of all these different up and coming pistolero guitars. It was called the U S metal series. And all of the hot guitar players in the eighties were getting their, their spotlight shots on Barney's U S metal series. David was one of those guitar players. David and I, we got introduced in the club and we put together a band called Aggressor, which was actually named after one of his songs. And we did a heavier version of what I was doing in the, in the E. Walker band. You know, it was all like Iron Maiden, Van Halen, uh, uh, Scorpions, Rush, well, you know, that kind of stuff. And I was doing that for a few months. And then uh, I got a phone call. My number got passed on to, to Blackie Lawless. And he says, yeah, I'm from New York, you know, and I played that scene and blah, blah, blah. And I'm out here in Los Angeles now, yada, yada, yada. And I got your number and I let your picture looks great. And you're a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker, you know, 
maybe you should take a chance, come out here, come and audition for my band, Al. And, and his band was called Sister at the time. It was after Circus Circus, he had a band called Sister. Right. And they had rotating members. You know, Now it's going to become the California revolving door thing. Right. You know, So he convinced me to come out. They paid my way, and, and which is tough because Blackie didn't have any money. He was broke. I don't know where he got the money from. This is now February 4th okay. of 1982. I landed in Los Angeles. Oh, all right. Talk about a Talk about a stranger in a strange land. Right. I mean, you put a you, you you put a New Yorker in Los Angeles, and I'm no you never talk about feeling out of place. And it was Blackie and Randy and Tony, Tony Richards, Randy Piper. Uh, Mike Solon picked us up at the airport. Mike Solon was Blackie's kind of like uh, assistant, but Correct. yeah, yeah. So Mike Solon drops us off at Blackie's house, and, and Blackie's telling me about oh yeah. Uh, uh, California, a whole different way of life, yada, yada, yada. He's telling me about all these books he's got in this, this little library. He's, he's got books by Joseph Goebbels and all these German uh, uh, generals from World War II and, <laughs> you know, about, about how, to, how, to, how to manipulate propaganda and, and to convince people of, of things. The bigger the lie, the more outrageous it is and all this other stuff. Anyway, next night he takes me to the Troubadour and I met David Lee Roth and the guys from Motley Crue, yada, yada. An hour later, we're at the Rainbow bar and grill and david lee roth comes and sits with us i mean how cool is that you know i mean they are down in rehearsal hall randy piper's got this re- huge rehearsal facility and they they showed me the songs they ran through it once or twice like that and they said all right get up and come on play and, and I, I i within that night and the next night i i, I had the gig so I, I learned all the songs i started writing a song with them that never got public pub, uh, never got uh, publicized it was called master of disaster <laughs> demos that are up on youtube and so forth um yeah and it's and a good song too it, people have compared it to wild child because it's very similar it so sounds I'm, it I'm, sounds similar to that and a couple other tunes that wound up on later albums it's interesting yeah. um my understanding is that not only did you record and co-write some stuff on the first demo you're also sort of indirectly responsible for it being leaked when your car was stolen or what have you um, but Correct. how how was that whole session process? Um, it, oh, and here's a really important question I've always wanted to ask. Is it an accurate statement to say uh, when Blackie, he's repeatedly claimed that Wasp were at that time only intended to be a studio band and not intended to be live? Is that accurate? Let me answer it this way. <laughs> it wasn't that, that Warlord, that was more accurate for Warlord, not so much for Wasp. Okay. Um, but we weren't called Wasp yet. We were still called Sister. Right. And 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 as I as I tell the story, um, I was outside his house one day on, on his phone talking to somebody in New York, and I kicked over a leaf, and there was a hornet under it. I stepped on it real quick. You know, my my instinct to step on it where it flies and gets me. And I kicked the leaf over again, and it wasn't completely dead. It was throbbing. You know, the tail was throbbing, and it reminded me of the old Green Hornet logo from from the '60s. Oh yeah. You know, remember that with the optic pattern around it. Oh, so I, lo- I love I the Green up. Hornet, the radio shows. Yeah. So I go in the house. I said, you know, Blackie had told me, we, we have to change the name of the band. There's too many bands using the name Sister. We, we need something new, something that's never been done before. And I said, hey, I got an idea for a band name. And I, he says, what? And I, he looks up at me, what? I said, Wasp. And he goes, Wasp. I said, yeah, I just stepped on one outside. I said, you remember, remember the old Green Hornet series with the Wasp curled up like that? He goes, yeah. And I said, and I stepped on it, and the tail was doing that, that throbbing, like it was pissed off, you know? And he goes, that's a good idea. Keep thinking like that. And and after the next night or so, we would do rehearsal. I guess he must have thought about it. And after rehearsal, he gets me and Randy and, and Tony together, and he says, we got a new name for the band. And, and Tony goes, what is it? And he goes, Wasp. And Tony goes, Wasp? Who names a band after a bug? And I said, the Beatles? You know, right. scorpions. Right. The scorpions, for crying out loud. <laughs> now, technically speaking, there's all four of us standing together in a room. And Blackie at that point validated, now the name of the band's going to be Wasp. So I would have to say, I think you'd agree, that makes all four of us 
co-founding members of the new band. Absolutely. Who came up with the name Wasp? Well, actually, that was Rick. Go back to Rick. I don't know. Him and Black were out building fog machines one day or something, and a wasp landed on his hand or something. He said, fuck, that'd be a killer name for a band. And Blackie stole it from him. <laughs> yeah, it was a great name, man. <laughs> well, the thing is, is, it was, I think Blackie put the periods in there, but it was, it definitely was Rick's idea. And he's claimed that for years, and I, I have to back him up on that. You know what I mean? I know it to be true. With pictures to prove it as well, my name. Right. Don't, don't you all. We, we, uh, Blackie uh, set up to record. We, we did a live three track demo, which is now everywhere. Um, and I had a copy, a master copy on a cassette, which, as you said, got stolen from the car that it was in. And then uh, uh, Blackie called Don Atkins, who was, he shot Motley Crue's first pictures and a whole bunch of bands on the, on the LA scene. Don came and, and we did, went to Don's parents' house in Torrance, I think it was, and we did a, a photo session. That was in April of 1982. Right. So that happened. So now we got pictures. Now we got a demo. I had some uh, friends come out from New York that worked in the labels uh, um, and uh, uh, like that. And we played them the demo. And then they said, yeah, we like it. It's good. It's heavy. But there's, there's no, we don't hear any hits. We don't hear any hits. Everybody wanted radio hits. Right. So we don't hear that. And then, and then I said, uh, you know, I was out at, at the laundry one day and I was reading one of the local L.A. papers. And here's the first promo shot of Mel Gibson in Road Warrior with the leather jacket, the tools hanging on his belt yeah. and the shotgun, the shotgun in the, in, the, in the holster. And I went back to the house. I said, the block, look at this image. This is cool. We should do this. Goes, no, 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 no. We're going to scare, scare off the record labels. We have to we have to get them first with the music or we'll about the image later. And, of course, what was their image when they first came out? It was total road warrior. Right, absolutely. Full-blown leather and, you know, asymmetrical outfits and everything. Right. And I had forgotten that there was a band of friends of mine from Australia called Heaven that looked like that right. already. They had, they, I'd seen them in, at Gildersleeves in New York years, a couple of years before that. So I forgot that Heaven had that look, and I said to Blackie, we should look like Road Warrior, and he, he shot it down immediately. Well, look at, you know, Mr. the guy who saves all everybody else's ideas and uses them later. <laughs> uh, and that, that was that was verified, to, validated by, by Steve Riley to me years later after that. So, so anyway, we're rehearsing, things are going fine, and then he comes up to me one day, he stops talking to me. He, he, there's like this, this weird, uncomfortable coldness happening i i didn't know what happened i thought maybe he's got some something personal and private going on and he just doesn't want to talk about it and he goes we got to talk so we sit down and he goes you know what it's not working out tony's not happy randy's not happy uh you're gonna have to you're out of the band and you're gonna have to surrender all your copies of the band pictures i'm like wait a minute but they're my pictures he goes but it's my band okay so you don't control the pictures the pictures are mine I'm like, I've never, I've never run into anything like this before. This is, this is new. I didn't sign anything, any waivers or anything, saying I'm not allowed to say I was in a band or use it like that. And, and he confiscated my photos. So when he left the house, I grabbed the negatives, went up to Sunset Boulevard, made some more copies. When I got back, he saw that the negatives were gone. He blew a gasket, and started yelling at me like I was some kid. And luckily, I had tucked some of the photos away. And I, I gave him what I had in my hand like that and he went ballistic this guy went nuts on me you know did hit or raise his hand but he was yelling and screaming now and and this is this is a guy who, who learned how to defeat his utilities because he, we were so broke he knew how to unscrew the the electric meter and and roll it back and then put the meter the the, the, the globe back on to make it look like nobody lived there and there was no power right you know which he learned he, he learned from he got a, a book by abby hoffman called steal this book this is this where I got all these ideas until the electric phone to, to, told the DWP got hip to that. They started putting a, a, a metal collar so you couldn't you couldn't unscrew the DWP thing back like that. But he would do it to the gas meter, do it to the electric meter, you know. So anyway, he kicks me out of the band. He goes, you, you're going to have to move out. You can't stay here. In your in your opinion, I mean, for crying out loud, obviously it was it was musically working. The first demo, a lot of those songs were a heck some of those songs were used as late as the third or fourth album or versions of them, right? So clearly songwriting's yeah. working. In your opinion, without throwing anybody under the tour bus, if you prefer, uh, do you think the differences were musical or just personal that led to your departure oh, from Wasp? Obviously, yeah, it's personal. It was obviously personal. Randy pulled me aside after the first after the first Wasp show at the Troubadour. They had an after party. And he goes, 
He goes, I'll tell you why you got kicked out of the band. He goes, Blackie didn't like the idea that you were trying to go out with the same girls he was going out with. <laughs> and you brought you brought a couple of them back to his house at some point, you know, one after another. And and it was like rubbing his face in it, you know, because he, he said, Randy goes, look, everybody knows who Blackie is. He's, he's, he's already known on the scene. You're a new guy. People don't know who you are. You have a mystique because you're from New York. So, so, you know, I didn't know that earlier in the evening he'd try to pick up girl A and she said, no, thank you. He'd try to pick up girl B and she'd say, no, thank you. I didn't know this had transpired. I bring home girl A back to his house because that's where I'm staying. Now he has to see the girl that said no to him earlier in the evening. And it's like as if I was doing it on purpose. Randy goes, you didn't know. You're innocent in that. But that's why he kicked you out. His jealousy just got the better, best of him. Oh, okay. And he, and he figured he could replace you. Which, uh, which you brings know. me to uh, one of the principal corrections uh, that I brought you on today to talk about. Uh, for in, in my defense, there's about five or six different origins of the band Wasp uh, wafting around the interwebs. Uh, and to hear you tell it, they're pretty much all wrong. I, I basically had to pick one and run with it. So, like, just before we move on from Wasp... So, for the benefit of those who may not be aware, who exactly was in the band at the time when you were? Like, what was the definitive lineup of, like, that those early days of Wasp before Chris Holmes showed up, before any of these people uh, came into the band? Right before I joined, Gary Holland from Dante Fox, which became Great White, was the, was the drummer. And Tony was in Tony was in Dante Fox. Gary Holland was in, in Sister. And then Gary left Sister. He couldn't stand playing with Blackie. He, he said, I was, I was going to strangle the guy. I can't stand it. Gary left Sister and joined Dante Fox, which became Great White. And then Tony joined Sister. So Tony was in the band right before I joined. So it was Randy Piper, Tony Richards, Blackie Lawless, and then I came in. And I replaced a guy they had, Joey, Joey, uh, Joey, Bag of Donuts, something, uh, uh, Italian name. I forgot his name. Uh, he's the guy in the early Circus Circus videos with the, the curly Afro-y kind of hair right. and the leopard outfit. Right. Uh, Blackie told me he got shot in the back in a drug deal, and they wanted to keep it quiet. Jesus. They didn't, want it, they, didn't, they didn't want that to get out. And the thing is, the guy disappeared. We've never heard from him again after that. He's never surfaced years later and said, okay, I was the original bass player in Circus Circus, whatever. I don't know what happened to him. Wow. So, you know, and and then, and then after... After I got excommunicated out, Don Costa came in. Come to find out, before before I joined, or before I got the audition, Blackie had been hounding Don Costa. To, to, and Donnie didn't want to have anything to do with Blackie either. Blackie hated Blackie. And he's like, no, 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 I don't want to play in your fucking band like that. You know, so, so I find out Blackie convinced Donnie to, to replace me, which he did for one show. Donnie upstaged Blackie with the, with the famous cheese grater and, and the knuckles on, the, on, his, on his face. Right. And and Black, Blackie kicked him out, and Donnie went to, to Ozzy Osbourne for one show, did the same trick, and got, got kicked out of that, too. So to answer your question, yeah, Blackie and Randy and Tony and myself, that was that was the, the, co, the four co-founding members of what became Wasp. Yeah, so the, so the pictures that we've all seen, you know, the, the monochrome photograph, which, by the way, uh, you talked about the little conflict over the pictures. How did those wind up in public? I assume you held on to some and, and so forth, and... He wasn't able to purge them all from the world. Right. And and it came up that pretty much was a surprise once Facebook got invented. And right. everybody's like you know, everybody knows Watts, just Chris Holmes and Tony and Blackie and like that and, and Randy. And then here comes my pictures all of a sudden scanned and boop and then people go, Wait a minute, who's this? And they go, Nah, it's Rick Fox. No, those are Photoshop. Those are you know, people other other musicians who didn't like me and guys in other bands who who are jealous and all they're saying, no, that's not true. Those are airbrushed. It's not really Rick Fox and whatever. Put his face in there. And then finally, I got Don Atkins to come on and say, no, that's Rick Fox in the picture. I took those pictures. So, you know, and, and it was hard getting validated. Some years after I had done my first internet interview with uh, Full and Bloom Music, I was one of the one of the first people uh, to be interviewed on there. Randy did an interview with them. And I've, it's on YouTube. I've got, it's a segment of, of, of him actually speaking and enjoying my picture and and they're asking him, so well, how did Rick Fox get in the band? And he, he said, you know, we got him in from New York and like that. And then he played. And But Randy, Randy backpedals and sidesteps. He's a very evasive. He doesn't like to answer direct questions. 
And he's like, well, I don't remember exactly what happened, but you know, we pet, we we replaced Rick and we replaced other guys. We kept auditioning people like that right. um, because maybe his memory doesn't remember or he doesn't want to deal with it either. Or, uh, but then the interviewer was just to Randy. So the name Wasp, where did that come from? And he goes, Rick Fox really came up with the name Randy. He goes, oh yeah, definitely. He goes, I'd never take that away from him. He goes, Rick definitely came up with the name Wasp. You know, yeah. so I'm I'm validated by that. And yet there's still people in denial out there in Wasp land who go, bullshit. It ain't, it, you know, it, it ain't true. It's a lie. It's all a lie. All right. You know what? Believe whatever you want. It's out there. I don't have to prove it. I, I've, I've interacted with so many international Wasp fans now that they said, you know what? We believe you. It, it makes sense. It's true. Right. And, then, and, you, and you can see even even in those early shots, um, you, you, you mentioned the Road Warrior look that the band later adopted. There's already a bit of a look in Wasp in those photos. You know, you, you're exactly. already kind of you can see you guys are kind of creeping your way there. Um, is yeah. you you it was still probably was it sister at that time or was it still wasp right <laughs> well once once we did the pictures we were already wasp right okay so you guys had like I, I from what I understand I was I just wanted to ask this question sister had like early shirts with like a pentagram and everything from what I understand was Blackie a little pissed like Nikki six sort of swiped that whole idea right like associating um, the band with the pentagram and what have you yeah i i had i had one of those shirts it, it was it was the word sister in lowercase letters inside a pentagram and the word was on fire and, and like that oh. there was a guy that was helping helping manage the band called For uh, forney that was a friend of blackie's yeah uh, well because blackie and nicky had played together in london and they became friends and whatnot there was there was that camaraderie between those two guys and and uh I remember Nicky came over one day and he was talking to Blackie about props and stuff like that. And, and Blackie gave him a couple of his old stage props like that. And, and I know Blackie claims to be like Gene Simmons, one of the first people to use the, the horn sign, which, which is not true. Right. Um, Somebody should tell Ronnie James Dio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I know that Blackie told me when they had sister and they played the whiskey, there was one show. He, he had a mannequin on stage and he shot it with a flare gun. You know, talk about fires and clubs. Right. They they just dodged they dodged a bullet with this. Blackie said the flare deflected off the mannequin, went up the stairs and hit some girl, and and luckily she did not sue. Jeez, you know, almost she, had a great white situation there. I didn't want to go there with that, but yeah, you, you, yeah. It, it, but they they doused her and and she wasn't too too badly damaged. So they jumped on it real fast. So. Right. Things like that. So, so yeah. Um, to try and, and and answer your question, yeah, Nikki did borrow some props from Blackie, and then of course Nikki went on and, and did a lot of uh, a lot of stuff on his own, and and the, he went on and used the pentagram and things like that. So yeah, so, but the, you know, Blackie wasn't the first band to use pentagrams either. There were bands out of the seventies, uh, like like out of England and stuff. Oh yeah, using, Venom, uh, Venom, and so forth. I mean, obviously, um, even before that, there was bands. I remember in, in late sixties uh, using pentagrams on albums. So. Right. You know, he's, he's no no pioneer on that, but he, he had no idea where he was going to go with, with what he was going to do because there was no band name yet. So, you know, until I came up with Wasp. And then after he canned me, he started putting periods in it, I guess, as a, a legal protection. And his back pedal was, you know, we just did it because we wanted you to be able to make up whatever you want for it and what you want it to mean. And it's like, you know, uh, somebody asked him in an interview, what does it mean? He goes, we ain't sure, pal. And and, uh, right. and I said it. it I, it's more fitting for me to say we're all side players. People found that funnier. <laughs> so, um, and, and then they, they asked Randy about that. They go, Rick, Rick Fox says it means we're all side players. He goes, Well, that's what it became. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, around headless children era or so. Um, so I, yeah. it, being a founding member of Wasp would be enough for both for most musicians. But you then went on to join a band that was originally from Tennessee um, that yeah. became a minor sensation uh, once it moved to the Sunset Strip by the name of Steeler. Today, of course, most noted for being a launching pad for uh, both Ron Keel and later a 19-year-old Ingve Malmsteen who had not yet joined Alcatraz. How were you brought into the fold and, and what were the sort of pre ingve days like in that band? Well... Uh, once I was out of Blackie's uh, house, his little cottage there, I, I wound up living with a bunch of, of call girls who lived across the, up the street from the whiskey, and which was right next to the apartment next door to Nikki Six, which is how I kind of met Nikki and we became friends. Met Nikki and Tommy. There were a lot of parties in the building, and I didn't really know 
anybody. I was kind of cut cut loose. Um, now I'm floating in L.A. and I don't know anybody. I don't have a way to get around. The day job that I had set up for me in Century City folded. It, it, and, and somewhere between the flight from New York when it was verified that I was going to have the job and I my arrival, it, the job somewhere vaporized. So I, I was out of a day job. I didn't have enough money. You know, so I, I, I tried to be resourceful. I looked after their apartment. I did, did the dishes. I cleaned, you know, vacuum, blah, blah, blah. I kind of earned my way, you know, like that. Until um, I moved in with this one, one guy, this other local nobody guitar player. And then uh, I started networking. And we were putting on rock and roll barbecues and inviting people. You know, we'd see them at the club and say, oh, yeah, Saturday, we're at rock and roll barbecue at our place. And Stephen Piercy, the guys from Rat would show up, and, and Greg Leon, yada, yada, yada. So I wound up auditioning for Rat and and not getting that. I auditioned for Greg Leon. I didn't get that. Um, you know, uh, I just was bouncing around. I, I, I wound up, I got four months of time, same amount of time with Wasp. I was in Wasp from February to May of 82. Uh, by the late summer, fallish of 82, uh, I played for four months with a group called Warlord which was the most musically challenging thing I've ever done in my life. It was like Rush meets Black Sabbath. I, cool. I'd, never, I'd never played minor scale music before. So, uh, you know, I, it was a challenge. And, and, and I stepped up to Rose the occasion. I learned the songs. I'm playing with them for four months. And I, one day I say to them, so when are we going to play live? And they both looked at me like deers, the drummer and the guitar player. They looked at me like deer in the headlights. What are you talking about live? This is a recording band. We're not doing any shows. I said, why didn't you tell me that four months ago? I said, I'm a performer. I play live. It's not like I wasted four months with you guys. I learned a lot musically, but this is not where I'm going. And I, I walked out. The, the, their version of it is that I wasn't good enough. So whatever. <laughs> Depends what side of the street you want to you you listen to. Right. So <clears throat> after that, I had put an ad. I, I jammed a few times with with Hellion, you know, Anne Boleyn, and, right. and her guys. You know, that's that's where that came in. I jammed with them a few times, and then I put an ad in, in Music Connection magazine, and I, I the ad was answered by Ron Keel. So a month or so before that, Steeler was playing the Roxy, and I was hanging out with Eric Carr, who's a friend of mine, from, drummer from Kiss in New York. Right. And 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 Eric says he goes, you know this girl Bambi, right? And I said, yeah, we're good friends. He goes, you know, can you introduce us, set us up, and I'd like to go out with her. I said, yeah, well, sure. I met Bambi while I was staying at that girl's apartment, where those girl, those girls were. So uh, um, and and again, there's just weird things of separation. Um, Bambi did a quaalude one day, and she she was taking a bath, and she was I was in one room, she was in another, and and I heard her voice stop talking. And I, I heard the water stop splashing and I ran in the bathroom and there she is under the water bubbles coming out of her mouth. And I scooped her up, dropped her on a bed, covered her with a towel like that. And, and she came to and realized that I saved her life. And, and if it was, if I wasn't there, she would have drowned in the tub. Wow. Turns out, turns out later, Eric Carr went out with her for, for a while. And eventually she became the model who's on the cover of the poison album, open up and say, ah, oh, with the tongue. Oh Yeah. So if I didn't, if I wasn't there at that time, that never would have happened. <laughs> wow. So, you know, fate, kismet, whatever you want to call it, puts me in the right place at the right time for some kind of important thing. Yeah, you're like the, the Forrest Gump of, uh, of L.A. Of rock and roll. <laughs> a little you're, not the first, you're not the first person to say that. <laughs> so anyway, Eric and I were watching Steeler play, and I'm like, uh, you know, the, 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 the band members were great. Musicians, musically, they were great. They were tight. Show wise, the show was Ron. I said, Ron is going. Ron's a fucking rock star. That guy is going to go somewhere. The other guys, they didn't really have kind of the look. Right. So I, I get, I get contacted by Ron Keel from my ad in, in Music Connection magazine. He said, I've heard your name around. Everybody says you got this rock star look. He goes, um, uh, the band's gone. I, I, I let everybody go. I said, that's kind of a leap of faith. You're like one of the biggest up and coming bands in the Hollywood scene, not the L.A. scene. He goes, yeah, but I can't compete with Motley Crue and Black and Blue and all these other bands that have that 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 kind of the it factor again. That's that's where it comes back in. Ron says you have, I don't know if he called it it factor. He goes, but you have what I'm looking for. Right. So I wasn't really hired for my playing ability. I was, uh, as Ron said in in one of the uh, inside inside the LA metal scene documentary, he pretty much comes out and says I I got Rick in the band for his look. 
which my, my critics have used as, as, a, as a derogatory point against me. So it's all about Rick's look, Rick's hair, Rick's look, Rick's hair. It's not yeah, about how Rick but, plays. I, I mean, considering the quality of some of the players that wound up in Steeler later on, I can't imagine you'd be hanging around if you couldn't have hung with... I mean, you played behind the guy who is probably considered the foremost guitar hero of the 80s, except for maybe Van Halen. You know what I mean? Right. So right. I can't imagine uh, you would have stuck around if uh, if you couldn't well, hang with that. Well, here's, here's how I put it. I, 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 in retrospect, I, I just, it just kind of came to me one day. I'm the first bassist on U.S. soil to go toe-to-toe with Malmsteen on a daily basis and survive. You, know, you can't scare me. Right? You know, I, I didn't sweat this guy, you know. And, and, and he, he, of course, conveniently forgets, like, when we weren't playing Steeler songs, that we were jamming on Scorpion stuff because he loved Uli Roth. We jammed on Purple songs because he loved Blackmore. Mm-hmm. You know, he was like Blackmore Junior with the stage moves and all of that. Right. He didn't really have a stage. He didn't have stage clothes. I loaned him my stage clothes. You know, right. so like that. So so yeah. So Ron Ron gives me. I met with Ron. He gave me a cassette tape. He says, "Learn these songs. No promises. We'll talk after that." So I learned the songs. I didn't just automatically immediately get the gig. You know, I say we Ron and I talked, and you know, yeah, I'm friends with Kiss, and Ron's a big Kiss fan. And I said, I, I can show you all the moves. Sean Delaney was the guy that taught Kiss all of their stage choreography. I said, Sean was a friend of mine. I can show you all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, so I learned the songs, and went back, and it was no, there's no band. It's just a drum riser, and then this was in one of the the, the, the most I don't want to say dangerous parts of L.A., but. It, it was one of the uh, uh, ethnically darkest places in L.A. <laughs> like that, and 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 uh, and you know, Ron and his guys were the only white guys there in, in that neighborhood. You know, it was right on the corner from Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. That'll, that'll, that'll give you an indication of the neighborhood. Right. So it was just, and, and the road crew kind of lived there. The road crew stayed with with Ron, but when when Ron fired the band or let them go. Then went the truck, the lights, the smoke machines, the fog, the the PA. Because the, the the guitar player's dad bought all of that. All that belonged to the guitar player. Wow. So when I say Ron took a leap of faith, I ain't I ain't shit yet. I mean, there was I walked in, it was nothing but a, a, a drum riser. That's it. Wow. You know, so I learned the songs. Ron and I started playing them one on one to each other until he felt all right. You know, this guy's got it. Before we move on, were you guys aware that there was a whole other Steeler in Germany at like the exact same time, and that whole I, thing was going I on? I think Ron. Yeah, I think Ron knew. I, I wasn't aware of it, but Ron knew. That was uh, 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 actually Rudy Pell then, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, good band Absolutely. actually, but yeah. yeah. Well, Ron said they have the rights to use Steeler in Europe, but they can't use it in the U.S. Wow. Whereas we have it in the U.S., and so we can't use it in, in Europe. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, something something along. Yeah, something along those lines. So, so then Ron gets in touch with Mike Varney. Mike was writing a, a, a column for Guitar Magazine, Guitar Player called the Spotlight for Guitar Players or something, yeah. uh, and up and coming guitar players. And Ron says, and I look at it prophetically, uh, Mike, we need a guitar player from hell. Little <laughs> did we realize that's what we got. <laughs> right. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. Yeah, and 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 I found out. Recently, when when I, I we did the Steeler reunion in Ohio, when I flew out with Mitch Perry, Mitch told me he was friends with Mark Edwards, and yet for whatever reason, never dawned on him to come audition for the band wow. before before Malmsteen, and and of course after Malmsteen, Mitch Perry was his replacement. Yes. So this is really weird how all the all the pieces keep moving back and forth like that. Right. We get on a con phone a three way phone conference with with Ingve. Yeah, man, I want to come to L.A. I want to come to California, man. I want to be in your band. I love you guys. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like all upbeat and, and, and wow, this guy's motivated, highly motivated, hard charger. Okay, let's let's see what this where this goes. Because we heard the tape. We, we listened to the tape. We're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, the only thing we near this was, was Eddie Van Halen, like you said. Right. We flew him out. He gets off the plane. And it's like, did, did, did the nice guy we talked to on the phone get... Is he still on the plane? Because this is not the same guy, <laughs> you know. He gets off the plane like you know he's into 666 and witchcraft and UFOs and met Black Magic and all this. Right. I think he was just trying. I think he was going for the shock factor because he was 19, you know. Right. He gets off the plane and he's like, you know, the, the Viking has arrived. <laughs> Talk about culture shock. Wait till he walks into the place where we were all living. Oh yeah, what is the the, the infamous Steeler Mansion? Uh, <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> that's the inside joke because it was the most Spartan uh, uh, place. It was like th- essentially three stores that were gutted, and the only thing was the, the, the main support uh, walls were holding it up. It was the most roach-infested place you've ever seen. Wow. And and he walked in, and he thought he was going to be walking into a nice place, and he, he should see, oh, man, talk, like I said, culture shock when, when he saw the roaches and he goes, you guys live here? <laughs> yeah. You know, the, you know, the people who live in the worst conditions in Sweden live better than how we were living. Uh, we get to, we eventually get around to, to audition and, and rehearsing and doing the songs. And Momstein one day turns, turns goes to Ron and goes, hey, man, is there anything you can do to these songs to make them like more interesting, man? Because they're really quite fucking boring. And I looked up at Mark on the drumizer, and Mark looked at me. And we looked at Ron, and you know, you know what, you know what the phrase "a slow burn" is when somebody gets red in the face, right? And they don't, they don't say anything. It's like, it's like they're, they're boiling. And, <laughs> and Ron did, the, Ron did the fastest slow burn you ever saw, and and Mark and I was like, did, did we hear what we thought we just heard? <laughs> new guy is, new guy is insulting the boss's songs. So that wound up in us auditioning other guitar players yes. in front of moms. I, I, I was gonna ask about this. Is this absolutely true that? He, as a result of this conflict, you literally tried out other guitar players right in front of Ingve's face, like literally. That's, that's God's honest truth. We did. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Wow. And he, he had to sit. He had to sit there. I mean, he couldn't avoid it. He wasn't in the room. He was, you know, the next room over. Right. But you, you could hear it. Mm-hmm. And and he he eventually went. You know what? All right, guys. All right, I'll play it your way. I'll play the game. Right. Let's do this. You know, and and like that, and and uh, next thing you know, we're the shows are booked, and right. and our 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 debut was March eleventh, eighty three. We opened for Hughes Thrall at the Country Club. Oh man, and great everybody, band! But uh... yeah, everybody in everybody in town was there. Just, it was like being born again, you know. And there's there's Pat Thrall standing in the doorway behind my ba- my bass amp, you know, the, the 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 stage entrance with his jaw on the floor watching Malmsteen. Yeah, and and Pat Thrall is no slouch. No, none. What I saw, and I, I went up to him after the show. I said, I don't know if you're going to remember me. He goes, You look familiar. I said, I met you backstage at the Palladium in New York when you played with Pat Travers and 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 uh, uh, Tommy Aldridge and Mars Cowling. And he goes, That's where I remember you from. I said, I was just a kid then going to the concerts. Here we are sharing the same venue. Isn't that fucking cool? <laughs> it is. And I said, I, and I said, I, by the way. I have both of your Automatic Man albums. And he goes, oh, thank you. So <laughs> that, that was pretty cool. I didn't get to meet Glenn Hughes, though. I don't know why. That's a shame. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I, that's a bucket list thing. Uh, yeah. He, um, is it true? Why, well, I, I suppose you're not you're not recording the album yet, right? For the first Steeler album, you're just playing live? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, not yet. Uh, that 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 came like a month or so later. We we figured let's let's right. get let's get on the stick and get this done. But Mike Barney says, "Come on up, come up to uh, was it uh, uh, Katati or someplace? Well, it was fifty miles north of San Francisco mm-hmm. uh, uh, to their to the studio, and and this is where all all of uh, uh, all the shrapnel artists were recording out of this little farmhouse uh, recording studio. Ingray didn't have his green card yet. Yeah, I was I was going to ask about that too. Is it true he? There was no, um, he didn't have a work permit or something. He literally could not take place in the recording sessions. Uh, just That's to... true. That's uh. true. He, he sat around with, with his girlfriend, with Tully, the whole time while we were recording. We did all the basic tracks, the rhythm tracks, and Ron did all his stuff, except for vocals. And then, uh, uh, through again, through the grace of God and, and, and the State Department, and, and God bless her, Dee Dee Keel, who was going out with Ron at the time, really cut through a lot of red tape. And, and wound up getting Malmsteen his working permit, his green card, like that. And then, so after we hit, well, while we were up in up, up above San Francisco, word got out. You know, Malmsteen's cult fans found out we were in the area, more or less, and they demanded that we stop recording the, the album and come to a show. So we had to drive back 50 miles back down to San Francisco at the old Waldorf, which is Y and T in Metallica country. Right. Yeah. You know, and we did a show at the old Waldorf. Uh, Ron and I went to the to Ron took me with him to the radio station so we could announce it and live on the air. And and it, the place was packed. It was mostly Malmsteen fans, of course, but you know, uh, like that. And and we did a show at the old Waldorf, and then we went back, finished the album, came back to L.A., and then Ron and Ingve flew back up. Now, when Ingve got his papers, his working permit, 
Mm-hmm. And, and he did all his guitar tracks, and Ron did his vocals like that and everything, and, and so forth. And then the album came out, and when the I was already out of the band by the time the album came out. I wasn't even invited to the to the record release. Yeah, but you records. you cut the whole thing, and yet you you don't wind up uh, being in the band. Uh, for, from what I understand, were, were you there? So you wouldn't have been there, I suppose, when uh, Ingve was pinched from the band by uh, Alcatraz's skeegy ass manager Andy Truman, or or were Andy you Truman, still in the band? Yeah. Yeah, well, see, right before that, right before the la- the last show of, of the, what we call the, the classic album lineup, mm-hmm. which was May May uh, of '83, May 21st, I think, of '83, um, at Radio City in Orange County, and then uh, I don't remember doing this, but they said I introduced Ingve to Phil Moog from UFO, who was in the audience, I guess, uh, and like that, because Phil had Phil was scouting for Ingve. Right and and Nick Ingve was already networking behind our backs. He, he essentially looking back, it makes sense. He used Steeler as the toehold to get into the U.S. because he, he wasn't getting anywhere in Sweden. Which he kind of did. Some, he kind of did in Alcatraz too. It's it's sort of a pattern. Yeah, he had. He told us he had a deal with CBS in, in Sweden, but you know this is the country that brought you Abba, so he couldn't get anywhere further than 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 what he got. So he had to get out of Sweden and get over to to the states mm-hmm. to to establish himself. Steeler was the was the toehold, the threshold into the U.S. And once he was some somewhat established with Steeler, and and word was getting out rather rather rapidly, then you know the, the networking started, and he had already been been uh, talking with with uh, Alcatraz and with Truman. So yeah, uh, I, I was I was there I was there the day that Truman showed up with him. Uh, it was actually it was the day after the gig. We were supposed to have a band meeting, and and nobody was there. Being the drummer, Ron wasn't there. Ingve wasn't there, and and then Ingve showed up with Andy Truman with the truck, and they took whatever Ingve had as far as gear wise, and and he didn't even say goodbye. He just walked out the door, and and that was it. Wow. Well, I guess you would be the guy to ask, because um, I was reading Ingve's um, the unofficial biography of Ingve, which is actually it has a lot of cool Steeler stuff in it, and um, mm-hmm. I they created the impression, and you can tell me whether this was accurate or not that you sort of function as the anchor <laughs> to sort of diffuse the situation between Mark Ingve and Ron Keel, you know, because there was a lot of conflict there. Um, was there any particular insights on how that whole situation wound up ultimately imploding? Or was it just that he was pinched away and that was it? I, I was kind of out of the loop on, on, on the networking thing. I didn't know that he would already be pinched and he was going to take off. It came kind of as a shock to me. Uh, I, I think the term anchor was is is a, is a flattering one. I didn't see myself at that as that at the time. Okay. Um, I I I kind of have to say that I never really fully felt like a a, a one to twenty five percent contributing member because it was essentially you got to remember it was Ron's band. So right. he's Ron was the boss. Uh, he split uh, managerial uh, business decisions with Mark, his drummer. So I was I wasn't I, I you can't say I was hired because I didn't wasn't I wasn't getting paid I didn't make any money at Steeler I didn't make any money off of royalties until 1985 Jesus. when the checks started coming in so uh, you know you can't really say I got fired because to be fired you have to be hired and to be hired you have to be paid <laughs> uh, on a technicality right. but it's like you said there was supposed to be a band meeting the day after the show and nothing happened and then I, I said to Mark what's going on and he says well it's going to fall upon me to, to be the bad guy the bad news i said what are you talking about what happened he goes well Ingve's out of the band i said oh really he goes yeah he's, he's off with andy truman he got a gig with alcatraz i went oh okay and i and he said so we're we're just starting the band over and i said what does that mean he goes well you're out of the band i said well, well you're in the band still he goes yeah i said and obviously ron's in the band yeah and Ingve's <laughs> out and i'm out i said what did i do he goes I, you know what i I, I really don't know how to tell you. I, I, I don't have an answer for you. So I, I never got a definitive closure as to why I was let go from Steeler. And I told Ron that before we did the reunion. He goes, well, it doesn't matter now. He goes, you're back in the band no matter what. So whenever we do a Steeler reunion, you're, you're Rick Fox, you're the bass player Steeler, and that's how it's going to be. But I still never got a definitive closure as to why I was out. Well, you should have so, started playing uh, country music. You could have gotten a head start on his future career plans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, but that's that's when I, I figured, you know what, I, I, 
I better start. I, 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 I have something of a bankable name at the box office. I might as well do something with it. And I said, let me let me put together a new band. You know, and and, and I, I I jammed with some really good musicians right after Steeler, and and all these guitar players who were, who really looked up to to uh, I don't know, I don't know if I should use the word idolized, but it was guitar players who really looked, worshipped Malmsteen style. I got contacted by a really really great guitar player, Chris Impelitary. Oh yeah, I heard you had you were momentarily jamming with uh, Impelitary there. I got to play with some really nice guys. I but you know I said guys I, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I don't want to. I've already I've had enough Malmsteen. I had enough Malmsteen to, for, to, for my lifetime. Impelitary came into his own later, but at that time Impelitary was very much patterned after Ingve Malmsteen. The styles were very close. Yeah, very close. Very similar. So, same scaling, but yeah. You did Sin uh, after. You, you sort of reformed that, did it for a spell, uh, seemed to hold a lot of promise. How did all that come about? Networking again, but still not knowing that many people. See, when, when, with Steeler, I was kind of isolated. We, we, we didn't really go out that much, and I wasn't hanging out in clubs. I didn't have a car and go out and come back and whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I didn't go out that much. Uh, we were kind of sequestered, so to speak. Uh, once in a while we do it. We went like to, to the Roxy as a band together to see YNT during the Black Tiger show and like that, <clears throat> things like that. And and that's how I kind of got the idea to write the intro theme for Steeler. Uh, uh, YNT had a thing on on that album uh, called From the Moon, and it had this little intro piece, and it, it inspired me. And that's how I wrote uh, Abduction, which was the the intro theme for Steeler. So I used to hang out at the, the record plant in New York. And then so I was hanging out with the one in the West Coast. I got to be a lot of really cool people and hang out with them. Ricky Phillips and from the Babies and whatnot. And guys from Kiss were there. I was talking to Gene. Of course, Gene remembered me from New York. And he says, why don't you put your own band together? He goes, you think you, they're not going to throw you out of your own band. Okay? Yeah. Put your own, you have a name. You, you, they know who you are. Put your own band together. And I went, okay. So that's what I did on Gene's advice. And I went out there and so, so that I didn't lose any, any momentum. But I didn't know how to properly screen people. I was just taking people on their on their advice, on their, their their word on it. I got introduced to a keyboard player who was I guess played the Arizona scene for a while, mm-hmm. and he kind of looked a little like Jack Greg Jufria. He had the same kind of haircut, and I I of course looked like Punky, and he looked like Greg. And okay, let's 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 put something together that has a, a flavor of angel to it, you know? Because I I wanted to I wanted to be an angel, so. I said, how about something like Angel Meets Judas Priest? I bet you that's never been done. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Cool. And I wound up getting I wound up getting uh, Greg Leon's drummer. Uh, I got uh, the guitar player. Uh, oddly enough, I, I was trying to get away from it, and I got a guitar player who was an Ingve fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fairness, you probably could have swung a dead cat and hit an Ingve fan at that time, uh, for, as far as guitar players go. <laughs> but, Great analogy. But I'm a cat lover, so I wouldn't swing a cat. Right. Uh, so, so we got this young 18, 19 year old guitar player. Uh, the singer again was somebody who was referred to me. He sounded a lot like Mark Storacci from from Crocus. And and we were we put this thing together. And and I said, look, you know, this is going to be based on my name being able to get us in, into the clubs because, you know, you're all you guys are essentially unknowns. Nobody knows who you are. I'm the catalyst here. I'm, I'm, this, I'm the like that. So let's use my name from Steel, like Steeler to you know, get us in the clubs. So they couldn't decide on a band name. The lack of vision that these guys had was starting to make itself known right from the very beginning. Yeah. I said, look, let's give this two weeks. If you can't come up with a name that really identifies who we are as a band, then we're going to use my band name Sin, which is Res- Resurrect Out. And they would, they would just die. You wouldn't believe the amount of, of adversity and, and negativity. They, no, no, that was your band in Jersey. We don't want to use that name again. I said, <laughs> all right, come up with something better. And in two weeks, they couldn't come up with something better. So it became it became sin uh, against uh, which did their chagrin. The keyboard player took us out to Phoenix, and we did a couple of warm up shows out there. Thank God we did. And we we did our first couple of shows there. And then we did one up in I think Tucson or something like that. No, uh, was it Tucson uh, or or uh, Flagstaff? Right. In the middle of winter. Oh, okay. We played in Flagstaff, like that. And I have to say, we I think we sounded like really close to Uriah Heep. Which was one of my favorite bands, all time bands. Yeah, good band. Uh, yeah, you know, so so we did have a heavy aspect of it, guitar wise, and we had the whole the whole the progressive keyboard thing because, you know, uh, Vince Gilbert played, you know, we had the great Jeffrey John Lord kind of thing going. That was that was his thing. So you could identify with a lot of these bands and hearing our material. And then uh, I I called up the Troubadour and I said, listen, I'd like to 
like to get have a bring a bring a band in there. And they went, okay, uh, so so uh, uh, what do you got? And I said it's a band sin. It's it's a new band like that. And they said, okay, well you know all the new bands start out Tuesday or Wednesday nights, you know at eight o'clock. And I said, wait a minute, I I I, I just sold out your show, your your club not long ago. I said I, I thought of it. they said no new bands headline. Who the hell are you? I said I'm, I'm Rick Fox. I was in Steeler. They went, oh. Okay, uh, Saturday night, um, you go on it, you get the headline slot, uh, who do you want to have open, who do you want to have closed? So it was like that. And the first show we did at the Troubadour and everybody from anybody, was Dave Lee Roth was there, the guys from Motley Crue were there, I heard Malmsteen was in the audience, everybody shared, the, the club was packed, and, and you know, we, we did fairly well, and it went on like that for about six months, we... Um, when we didn't headline, we, we were supporting Malice and Odin, and we even did a gig with Steeler at uh-huh. Perkins Palace, like that. So, you know, we, we, we played around a lot and like that. And then within six months' time, it was like, you know what? We don't need Rick anymore. We can do this on our own. And, and, and the, singer, the singer actually went told some people, we're going to kick Rick out of the band and steal the name. I mean, there's a special kind of stupid. <laughs> and that was, that was one of them. So I, I had, I had, meanwhile, trademarked, service marked the name and the logo, and they were bringing in a manager I never heard of, some woman who was a friend of, of uh, Vince's, and they put a contract in front of me, making her the manager, and I said, all right, let me go have this looked at by by an attorney, and, and that be, I then became the loose cannon and the guy that couldn't be trusted just because I wanted to bring the contract to a lawyer and have him look it over, right, you know, and and it became one thing, it became, and the boil was about to pop. And we went in the studio to record what would have been our first album. Uh, Bill Matoyer from Metal Blade Records was our engineer. And it just, that's when it happened. And the pus went everywhere all over the wall. Yeah. It, it, just, it became a big argument, fight, blow up in, in the studio. I packed up my bass. I went up to Bill. I said, Bill, I apologize. I know this is not very professional, but I'm not going to deal with this anymore. This is, this is not professional. And I walked out. And now it became a fight over the name. The name that they didn't want in the first place. Now they wanted to keep it. So it was, they were trying to book themselves as sin in the clubs. And then I had the service mark and the proof that I ownership, ownership of the name. And I'm calling up the, you know, the, uh, the clubs going, you can't book them as sin. You'll get sued. Here's the, here's the paperwork to prove it. Now, now that is the, the fly in the ointment is, okay, so now how do we handle this? And the news, the, 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 the clubs were, who run the ads, it's like sin versus sin. Which one is, which one is which? Yeah. It, it, there's your conf, conflict of, of the trademark, and mm-hmm. I, I got introduced. I got introduced to Ronnie James Dio's uh, Black Sabbath's attorney, Stan Diamond, mm-hmm. and and I explained the situation to him. I showed him the paperwork. He sent him a bunch of cease and desist letters. Long story short, I know it's too late, but um, they they, changed, they had to change the name. So that became Jaguar, oh, and that's okay. how Jack. That's how Jaguar was born out of a out of a night of of drunken revelry. And I guess they tried to say the word. Uh, uh, Jaguar, and they went up saying Jaguar, and that was just so you got that. you. It was a slaughter situation, is what it was. The other guys wanted to do their own thing, and you wound up with the name, but they all went off and formed. It was like a Vinnie Vincent invasion slaughter thing, basically. Uh, yeah, they thought they were going to try and get the better of me, and it did it backfired on them. Funny. So you, what I, happened, that's what, that's the uh, second that's the second time Dana Strum's been involved in one of those situations. That's interesting. He comes in just after this. I get a phone call. I don't know how he tracked me down. I get a phone call from a guitar player that I played with in Jersey from a, a, another attempt at trying to reform a, a, a lineup of sin. Uh-huh. And it, this guy was. He calls me up and he says that their band just broke up. And I said, "What band is that?" And he says, "We well, we had a band on Long Island called Alien. We were on Mongol Horde Records, mm-hmm. which was the label that had Takashi and Thor on it." So I said, Jay, why, how did you get my number? He goes, he goes, well, Jay, Jay was, Jay was one of my, my favorite guitar players to play with, but you couldn't trust him as far as you could throw him. The guy was always finagling something. Hmm. He was a scammer. And and I said, Jay, you owe me like four hundred dollars for the phone bill you stuck me with in in, in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I said, you want me to forgive that? And he says, well, listen. He goes, well, let me just tell you why I'm calling. He says, I understand, you know, you're friends with the guys in Kiss, and they're auditioning guitar players. Do you think you can get me a, a donation with them? <laughs> I said, after all of this, you want me to open these doors for you and get you on a different... First of all, they already have a guitar player. Right. That, they already had Vinny at that point. Right. I said, however, I'm reforming Sin. I, and I told him the story I just told you, 
And he says, well, we could come out there. And I said, who's we? He goes, me, the singer, and the other guitar player. And I said, well, I don't want to do a, a five-piece. I want to do four-piece. No, 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 trust me. This guy played with Sabotage. He's, he's a great guitar player, blah, 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 blah. And so what happened was Alien had folded. They fell apart. Uh, their bass player got involved in a, in a, in a, a, a shooting or something in, in Florida during the drug deal. There's another bass player involved with a drug deal. Right. Harkins to, Harkins to Wasp. So, or or to, to Circus Circus. <laughs> and he, so Damien, their bass player, uh, band leader for Alien, was busted. He was in jail. There was some drugs involved or whatever. Hmm. Band broke up. Band broke up. So Jay and, and Frank Starr, later of the Four Horsemen, and Richie drive across country, and they hook up with me, and we, we reform a, a heavier version of Sid. Uh, I got a drummer, local drummer, who was really good, so we, I reformed Sin. We were like one of the biggest almost signed bands out of the L.A. metal scene. And, and Music Connection magazine voted us, the poll voted us the top drawing metal band of L.A. for 1984 over Keel, Striper, and Odin. Right on. So I, I, I knew I was doing something right. Thank you. There's a band I did lights for on Capitol Records. They were called Face Dancer. They were out of Baltimore, Maryland area. The manager became a friend of mine, a guy named Bill Ace. No, I'm sorry, Bob Ace. Bob Ace became friends with Dana Strum in Los Angeles. Mm. Dana was playing in a, in, a, in a new wave band called Modern Design. Yeah, you know, really, really square looking band. <laughs> I wasn't impressed. Uh, Dana has Dana had all of all of the, the physical attributes on stage of a marionette with, with almost all the strings missing. He had no body coordination whatsoever, uh, and still doesn't. But, You're but right. uh, you know, if you've seen him live, you know what I'm talking about. I, so, I do. We're doing shows. We're doing shows. We played the Stardust Ballroom. And uh, Lucy Forbes, who I was friends with from the cup from the uh, country club days, she was a, a, one of the top booking agents in town. Brings a guy named Todd Cooper to the show, and Todd approaches and says, you "Guys, got something? You got the it factor, and I'd, I'd like to be part of what you're doing." And I'm like, "Who? Who are you? I don't know. You never heard of you before." It comes to New York, Adam. Who the fuck are you? And and he says, "Well, uh, my dad is is so and so Cooper Epstein and Hurwitz, one of the big you know law firms in Los Angeles." And it turns out Todd worked at Jerry Weintraub's company, Management 3, out of Beverly Hills. Okay. Jerry Weintraub puts out all the, those big movies, Karate Kid, blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and man, you know, they handled John Denver, the Eagles, uh, uh, the biggest 70s bands. Uh-huh. And I said, you guys are interested in us? I said, yeah, I'm going to get you guys, to, I'm going to get you a deal, and we'll manage you. And I said, all right, let's see where this goes. I mean, technically, I was still kind of uh, micromanaging the band because I was doing all of the... The, you know the, the detailed, meticulous stuff, the fan club stuff, all that, the merchandising, all of that. Todd pretty much sat behind his desk and, and read his paperback book and went out and played tennis. But you know, we had muscle. We had Jerry Weintraub's company behind us before you even have a record, or or even are starting to record a record or anything. Well, we did a demo. We did just we went in the studio one night on one of my Steeler royalties and we recorded the live set straight through. And I would I would make little uh, two and three song uh, demos of it and send it to the various fan magazines, the fanzines that were up and coming at this point, and and so they could review us. And, and we were getting some publicity like that. And they loved us. They loved the loved way we sounded. We were real heavy, you know. We had elements of European metal and American metal like that in us. So right. we got compared to Accept and you know stuff like that. So we're getting about as far as we could go. Dana, Dana here comes Dana Strum. Right. I don't remember exactly how Todd knew Dana. But Dana was the guy, it was the word on the street. He was the one that put Randy Rhodes and Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, he's been he's been uh, riding that one for a while. Yeah, um, and after Randy, he put Jakey Lee in Ozzy Osbourne's band. Right. But then, you know, to read the interviews, it wasn't just Jakey. It was George Lynch. There was this guy. It was like tons of guitar players auditioning for Ozzy Osbourne. But right. Jakey was the one that got the gig. And, of course, Danny gets a finder's fee. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so... Dana's hooked up, and he's and he's hooked up with somehow with Chrysalis Records. So, and this is this is, I didn't know he was involved with Vinny at this point. So they take us in the studio on a spec deal, and we went into uh, uh, there was a studio in Burbank. Uh, Paul McCartney recorded there. Stevie Wonder. It was, uh, uh, Ken, it was called Kendon, um, and we'd go in at night when there was no there was nobody in there. It was just spec time, mm-hmm. and and uh, oddly enough, uh, Todd's. One of Todd's brothers was an engineer. He yep. engineered our tape. Dana okay. produced. He engineered, and it started to sound like, like wow, like we started to sound like Priest. Nice. I mean, Dana was was taking the songs apart 
and and kind of rearranging them. He 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 edits an ele- element. Um, listen to me, element. He lay he, he infused an element of discipline in playing styles to, in Jay and Richie that I couldn't do because Jay and Richie were huge Iron Maiden fans, and I said, guys, there is an Iron Maiden. Stop smoking pot and writing Iron Maiden lead. <laughs> Okay, we we want to get on we want to get on the radio. So there already is an Iron Maiden. Stana was able to break them of that. So we 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 did a four song demo. Word was getting around that the labels were like freaking out. Like who the hell is this? I walked in the studio one night. I guess they weren't expecting me to show up exactly when I did. And there's Vinnie Vincent sitting at the mixer listening to one of my songs, Cyro on the Run. <laughs> And, and listening to the playback, and it's like, oh, hi! <laughs> I didn't know you were going to be here so soon. Right. I said, I know you. Said I walked into SIR Studios one day, and you were wearing Ace Frehley's lightning boots, and you were playing his licks all by yourself in the room, just the Marshall stack and you. And he goes, that's where you look familiar from. There's that. There's that line again. Right. Anyway, so so he says, yeah, you know, I, I've been listening. Dana's playing me your song here. I really like this. I'd like to re-record it someday, maybe, and, and have you be involved. I went, oh, that's nice. We never, we never really defined what "have you involved" meant. <laughs> and it, just, it never went, it never went anywhere after that. They wanted and you so, involved in the sense that you would be on the other side of the country listening to it. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting how you put that. Uh, you've, you've, you've done some homework, I can tell. Oh, I, I, well, I got my BC Rich bass endorsement through that tape and whatnot, and 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 Dana, I said, essentially was going to get us, I guess, signed through Chrysalis because being with 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 the invasion, and then. Uh, um, uh, Fred Corey, before he was in Cinderella, he was playing in locally here in a band called London, mm-hmm. and he was quitting the band. And he said, "I'm going to play with you instead." I said, "Okay, great." And then I went to my publicist, and we were at the Nam show, and she gives me a copy, an advanced copy of the Vinnie Vincent Invasion demo. She goes, "You're not going to like this." She goes, "There's a song on here you need to listen to." It was like on their second album. Uh, it's called "Let Freedom Rock." I went, okay, and I put it on. <laughs> and I just sat there in shock. I went, this is my, this is my song. This is on the run. Well, what's the linchpin between Freedom, Let's Freedom Rock and On the Run? Dana Strum. So in, in, a, in a breach, of, a professional breach of, of, of confidence and, and a conflict of interest, Dana had handed my song On the Run over to Vinnie Vincent, and he re-recorded it as, as it, the first three opening chords are the same three opening chords from my song uh, Break Down the Wall to Stop the Rock. And they cut right into the hook of, of on the run, oh. and and the, yeah, the, the lyrics are different, but it's the same hook. And I played it for Fred Corey, and he goes, uh, I, I'm gonna, "I just got a gig in some band. You're called Cinderella." Nobody knew who they were at this point. <laughs> yeah, I said, I said, "Oh, okay." And I said, "Well, I want you to hear this." And I played the song. I, I said, "You remember on the run?" He goes, "Yeah, it's my favorite song." I played him on the run, you know, the the, de- the demo version that we did with Dana, the album master demos, and then I played him without telling him who it was, and I played him Blood Freedom Rock, and he goes, what the hell is that? I said, that's the Vinnie Vincent invasion. I said, that Dana Strum handed ours. He goes, you just got taken to the bank, dude. I and then uh, Vinny wound up being taken to the bank by uh, <laughs> Strum anyway. Yeah. So it all, it's isn't a circle that, of isn't life. is funny Simba? how things work out? Right. Isn't it's that funny <laughs> how Dana life works out? Um, um, I called up Chrysalis, and I threatened to sue. Chrysalis apparently was out of the loop on this. They right. called up Strum, Strum gets on the phone with me and goes, listen, you sue us, and we'll bleed you dry in court, and we'll counter sue you for being an asshole, okay? You can't copyright a hook. I said, tell that to George Harrison, who copied, who wrote My Sweet Lord based off of uh, uh, the Chiffons, He's So Fine. I said, Harrison lost. Nobody believed me. They were like, Vinnie Vincent's a great fucking songwriter. He's been, he's played with Dan Hartman, for for God's sake, you know, and instant replay and all that. I said, Vinnie doesn't need your songs. Who the hell are you? Well... (laughs) Years later, here comes the validation. Uh, um, Bobby Rock's book comes out, 
and he spills it. He says, yeah, he goes, the song was obviously stolen from this band Sin. Wow. So, and we knew it, but there was nothing we could do. And I confronted Bobby Rock and, and Mark Slaughter at the NAMM show about it. And they said, Dana made us do it. Mark, you sang the tracking vocals before we got the other singer on the tape. You knew this was what this was, what this was, do, what was it going? What, what are you doing? He goes, Dana made us do it. Dana and Vinny made us do it. So that incarnation of sin folds basically in a hail of litigation? It just got to a point where lack of confidence, I, I think, for, for lack of a better term, lack of confidence. The guys just, they just, they just fell apart like sand through my fingers. I, in a, in a fit of depression, one day I was, I was brought to, to Mate's rehearsal studio on the way to Magic Mountain to see Striper in a pouring rain which we never wound up doing. And there was a band that was signed to, to Niji Management, which was Ronnie's management. It was a band called Burn, mm -hmm. and they were auditioning bass players. And my publicist was working with them, and I had already written their press release. And and turns out they were getting rid of the guy. They had Bill Sweet, who was their bass player. The singer sounded like Ronnie. That's why Ronnie loved them. Ronnie loved uh, Burn. You know, it was like, like Ronnie Jr., I'm rehearsing with Byrne for a couple, a few months, whatever, and, and like that. And and uh, I was friends with the, the road manager of Loudness. Nice. Uh, and, Great band. Right. And this, is, this was the Lightning Strikes tour. They were starting to break into the U.S. Yeah. And they had Cinderella and Poison flip-flopping over open and middle middle slots to support Loudness's first, you know, big tour in the U.S. So he gave me some laminates, some tour laminates. He goes, any city in America you want, you're in. I'm like, cool, thanks. So they happen to be playing in Phoenix. I go out to Phoenix, and, and I'm at the Loudness show, and I meet this guy who's some local local small-time promoter and like that, and he introduces me to, to Jim Keeler, who was the guitar player of Surgical Steel. Yeah. And, and you know, it was, wasn't really much of a conversation. Hi, how you doing? Oh, oh yeah, you were in Steeler. Yeah, you were in Surgical Steel. Yeah, okay, I like that. I didn't know who Surgical Steel was. I'd never heard of them. I was there to see Loudness and Cinderella and Poison. You know, like that. And I, I, and then after the show, I went, I came back to Hollywood. And, and literally, the minute I, I put the key in the door, I was walking to my apartment, my phone was ringing. And it was this, this promoter guy. And he's like, You got to come back to Phoenix. You got to come back to Phoenix. And his name is Brad Laughlin. He goes, Jimmy wants you in the band. Jimmy wants you in the band. You, you got to, you know, okay, so he wants to be in the band. So what, what do you want to do about it? And like that. And I wasn't that, that brusque about it. But I said, No, you got to come back out. And we'll, I said, You got to have to fly me back out there. I just walked in the door. Uh, they made an arrangement. They booked a flight for me to go to fly back to Phoenix. Meanwhile, I made some phone calls. I went, "Who the hell's Surgical Steel?" Right. And they said, and, "And I had we had we didn't know about Thunder Alley yet. That they're they're, they're, they're part in, in in the movie in Thunder Alley mm -hmm. um, with Leaf Leaf Garrett." And and I the people I was just told, "If you love Judas Priest, you'll love Surgical Steel." They, they sound just like Judas Priest. I went, oh, okay. The singer sounds just like Alfred. I went, oh, okay. That's the power. It's just one of those Twilight Zone moments. I was in Steeler. Follow me here. I was in Steeler <laughs> with a guy named Ron Ron Keel. Right. And now I'm in a band called Surgical Steel with a guy named Jim Keeler. And Surgical Steel, out here on local television, they were be best known for constantly making television appearances with Rob Halford, who wrote Steeler, the song that they were originally named after. Thank you. Come full circle. Right. So so uh, I didn't get a chance to meet Halford. He wasn't around at the time when I was involved with Surgical Steel. Right. Turns out, Jim Keeler, here we go again, did the same thing to Surgical Steel that Ron Keel did to Steeler. Right. He fired the whole band and was starting over. Jim Keeler, publisher of Where It's Hot, formally, and I guess actually recently, back again as the lead guitarist for Surgical Steel. Whenever there's a benefit. Now. <laughs> so I was replacing yet another bass player, and, and, and he put in a whole new band together. And, and he goes, he calls everybody, he called me Chief. He goes, Chief, we're doing an album next week. Here's the songs, learn them. I said, well, don't you want me to audition first? He goes, Chief, you were in Steeler, for God's sakes. I know, I know you can play. Okay, here's the songs, learn the tape. So I had a I had a week to learn these songs plus whatever I would I brought into the to the to put on the table for them to record you know my stuff uh, I, I was able to bring a couple of songs in and and we were at El Shaton Studios in the shadows of Camelback Mountain uh, recording what would be the Surgical Steel album until the financial backing 
fell through. That was that, through. as my understanding. It was it was a weird band in that they were pushed pretty hard. They had actually some connections. They were pretty good. A lot of their members went on to be in bigger stuff. Like it was known as like the musical vehicle for a young Jeff Martin, right? Of Racer X and uh, yeah. and Badlands Absolutely. fame. Later Absolutely. On. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, Jeff, Jeff came up and sang with us at one show. You know, he, he came up and did two, maybe one or two, three songs. You know, and yet, uh, there, but, it, for whatever reason, just uh, didn't didn't go anywhere. Well, I, there was lots of things I can put my two cents in, or depending if you want to believe it or not. But uh, you know, Steel or uh, Surgical Steel was was Jim Keeler's baby, and and uh, I, it's like they knew. I had something to bring to the band by, by way of my name, but they wanted, Jim wanted to keep his thumb on it. So I said, look, I can bring you guys to LA and, and hook you up with some labels and get us some really big shows, some showcases, country club. All that. And Jim's like, don't worry about it, chief. I got it. I got this. I got this. I got this. So I was constantly being kept under that, that control thumb and not being given any, any ability to bring more to the band than what I already did just by playing along. It was, it was Jim's band. It was his show. And that's pretty much how it went. And so I just had to go along for the ride. And ultimately, you wind up just leaving the band. Probably before it really implodes, you were already gone, right? Uh, we, we were we were playing at um, the hot bar there. It was uh, uh, Rockers. And, and that's where I met Madam X. Mm-hmm. We became really good friends. Uh, uh, Brett Kaiser just happened to be leaving at that point, making his exit. And I met for the first time a very young, unknown singer named Sebastian Bach who was getting ready to join Madam X. Oh, I'm sure he'll never go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and then of course, uh, uh, Flotsam and Jetsam uh, opened for us while we supported Lita Ford on a New Year's Eve show. Yeah, you, uh, you, I imagine you played with a lot of local bands. Uh, did you ever play with uh, like Icon or the like? No, I never got to meet those guys. I just heard about them. They were like the hometown big guys. Surgical Steel were about on that same level for a while there. Uh, it was them and Schoolboys, I think, were the two big Phoenix bands. Yeah. And I mean, while we were recording, Jim had to eat a little crow and bring bring a, a, one of their, their Surgical Steel drummers back in to do some songs because the guy we had, his meter was all over the place, and, and we had to let him go. I, said, I brought him in. I said, Jimmy, listen to us. Listen to the rhythm section. And and he heard. He goes, yeah, you're right. He goes, this guy's he's, he's he's not on. So of course at that time George Lynch was living in, in Phoenix with yeah. his wife, and and he and who was always hanging out at George's house but Mick Brown. Right. So, I, I was just about so, to mention that a lot of Phoenix connections there. Yeah. Oh uh, well, I have to I have to amend myself. Uh, the guy who was helping produce us was Dan Wexler from Icon. Oh okay. Yeah. So they made a phone call and Mick Brown came down and and Mick and I played. On, on, a, on a song uh, that I brought in. Uh, this, it was one of the Sin songs. We did uh, We Got Your Rock, I think it was. Okay. And and uh, and Jimmy was just being a pain in the ass, fidgety in, in the studio. And Dan, 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 Dan goes, get the hell out of this. Leave him alone. You know, like that. And, and Mick and I just locked. We, 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 we just fucking locked. And, and Mick goes, I don't know where all this, this, this bullshit rumors come from, but you can't play. He goes, you're just as good as Jeff. Meaning Pilsen. Yeah. Uh, which I took as a high compliment. Yeah, Jeff he, Pilsen's he, a great bassist. He's a fucking great bassist. I'm not I'm not great. I'm I'm good at what I do, but I'm not great. And and here's Vic Brown telling me, just as good as Jeff. I'm like, oh, fuck okay, fucking hey, thank you. We're, so we're on stage playing surgical steel and I'm throwing my picks out in the audience like that and then I, I threw one and it, it kind of it flew like these little Chinese the, the Japanese the shuriken stars. So I threw one of the picks, and it, it flew, and it hit Jimmy Keeler uh, uh, in his stomach, and, and it just, like, stayed there. It just, like, hit his, hit his and it, it sat on the top of his guitar, in other words. So so he looks down, sees the pick, picks it up, and flings it back at me, and it flew right in my eye. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, picture a, a, three, a three-cornered spinning piece of plastic, full speed, hitting me in the eye in the middle of a song. And and I couldn't do anything. I, I couldn't cringe. I couldn't stop. I, I just blink, hear, and and play on. And he thought it was the funniest thing in the world that I got hit in the eye. Wow. Which, after the show, in the dressing room, I, I fucking let him have it verbally. Not physically, but verbally. And I said, I, that, that's that's it. I'm, I'm fucking out of here. That's it. I'm not going to put up with this, this stupidity anymore. And, and, and all the other drama that goes with it. And, and that was the night I, I quit, and I, I walked out, and... Wow. Surgical steel. 
was this was, uh, was this before or after we're like in the late 80s now you're um was this before or after you were interviewed for the air quotes documentary the uh, decline of western civilization uh too i think it was this has happened before that because uh, i i was whenever i was back in town i'd go I, I lived right across the alley from the club that had the cat house uh-huh so i was always i was always in the cat house and and uh, like that and and uh, so I went back to hanging out in the cat house again. I just got back. From, I said, oh, I just got back from Phoenix. I was playing here, recording, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean anything to anyone in, in L.A. because it was a whole different bubble. They they were isolated from that. Right. Uh, the, the guy, I, the guy well, while I was out in Phoenix, I, I went to an after party, and, and the guys from Faster Pussycat were there, and they were like so happy to see someone else from L.A. Mm -hmm. So they were the only ones that they were the only ones that knew that I was playing and recording out in Phoenix. While I was at the Cat House, I got approached by Penelope Spheris' daughter Anna, and she goes, "Do you want to be in this movie my mom's doing?" And I said, "Well, okay." And what it's what it what was it? And she gave me kind of a brief rundown. I didn't know that every band in town was going to be in the movie either. But, right. You know, and I, I and I didn't have a band now it, to be in to play for the movie. You know, for for the production. So. It just became the interview segment, you know, with the light bulb kids. I hook up with the singer. We didn't. We were putting a band together. We didn't really have a name, so we called it Sex, just because we didn't have anything. So we. That's what we used in the movie one during the interview. And and I brought my bass as a prop because I didn't know what what it was going to consist of. So so we were in the movie and and declined. We saw the movie when it came out. And yada yada yada. What if you don't make it as a rock star? That question is not in my mind. The minute you doubt is the minute you lose it. I'm like him though, it really doesn't enter my mind. And, and it, it is what it is. It is what it is in the sense that it's completely engineered and fake, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the whole scene with Ozzy and the shaky hands and the... And the Chris Holmes at the pool. Chris Holmes with the bottle full of water. I'm actually really curious about this because I, I talk about this in almost every episode of Metal Mythos, but the year 1993 is like this fascinating cutoff point where it was suddenly like brutally unpopular to play anything remotely resembling metal. And it's funny That's because true. the audience was still there. They were just like despised and treated like trailer trash. So how did you, per Unless... how did you perceive like the changing dynamics of the music industry after Cobain pressed a shotgun to the base of its brainstem and pulled the trigger? Uh, thanks for the visual. Um, <laughs> oh, it's it's a visual I enjoy. Uh, can, yeah. But no, by all means, how yeah. how did you weather uh, the well, '90s? Because you sort of reinvented yourself. There was sort of uh, you know you moved into other areas, from what I understand, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I I grew the I grew the layers out of the hair. I try to. I didn't. I I despised the whole Seattle thing. Um, right. But right be right before that, I was like eighty. It was eighty eight. I put I put together. I got called up by by one of the the, uh, the booking agents at the Troubadour. I said, "There's a guitar player who just got in town from Detroit, and and he's 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 trying to contact you or something." And I said, "All right." So he puts me in touch with the guitar player, who was actually was one of my favorite guitar players to play with. Uh, uh, this guy was great, and and he he eventually wound up moving into my apartment, being one of my roommates, and we put together the band Thunderball. And we got uh, a drummer uh, on, a, on a recommendation from a friend of mine from a, from the East Coast. Guy guy snagged the audition right away. He was, he was great. And and uh, uh, I wanted to get oh, Lucy Forbes. We were looking for singers, and Lucy Forbes was running a, a kind of a clearinghouse for musicians, you know, placing them in bands and stuff. So we we get our drummer Cecil Freeman, and and uh, Lucy found us a singer from a Christian band out of Kentucky called Bride. Oh, I've heard of them. Which was which was uh, Dale Thompson. Yeah. So Dale wanted to wanted to give the Christian thing a break for a while and and try out L. A. So uh, he became our first singer. Um, I, I I got some budgeting together and I produced a, a three song demo and then like that my, my song uh, Gypsy Brandy, which was kind of like my my homage to to uh, White Snake's Still of the Night. We 
started playing the clubs and we we were doing okay. You what what kind of like what was the vibe? Because in the '90s, uh, people were musically all over the place from the LA scene. What what sort of stuff were you doing? Hollywood was kind of the trash glam. Everybody was trying to copy a hybrid between Faster Pussycat and Guns N' Roses. Right. That was the that was the predominant vibe before Seattle really hit. Right. This is just just pre Seattle. Yeah, there was uh, that, it, it was it was in that awkward area where all the bands in like the late eighties didn't want to admit they were glam anymore, so they just wore jeans and leather and kind of jumped into the blues metal thing. Like, oh, we all listen to Zeppelin right. now, right? <laughs> yeah, so, and everybody everybody grew all the layers out of their hair, right. and and it was like Hanoi Rocks meets Faster Pussycat meets Guns N' Roses meets you know some kind of street sleaze rock and roll image. Uh huh. We nailed a nationally televised Western Union commercial, and we played a band in it called Putrid Rage, and I was making some, some royalties off of that. And then uh, the guitar player's brother-in-law was doing a couch tour in my apartment and convinced him to leave the band and that this was this kind of music wasn't going to stick around. It, was, it sucks and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so Joey wound up quitting the band. Thunderball fell apart. I tried one more time, and I put a group together called Flyboys, which was based off of not not a, an ethnic thing, but the actual World War II, what they used to call the pilots. Right. Did nose art with the girl and on the on the nose of the plane with the bullet holes coming through the through the, the skin of the airplane, and we, I was trying to approach something closer to my roots, which was like Steppenwolf meets the Cult, mm-hmm. that kind of. And I picked up a guitar player out of Philadelphia who knew all the guys from from Cinderella, and, and it was it started to sound really good. It was it was a total departure of what I was doing. It was not metal. It was like heavy hard rock bluesy kind of stuff. Right. We did we did a couple of shows, and I started to find myself in a situation where these guys were like, you know what, let's let's just let's do this without Rick. <laughs> Again, it was it was it was a Jaguar scenario, and and the people that I was bringing in to to get behind the band said. Well, if there's no Rick, then there's, then there's no band. We're not we're not going to help you guys. So I wound up out of the band, and, and I'm not putting my thumbs in my suspenders on this, you know, they're, they're bragging, but I join a band, and they start to go somewhere. I leave the band, and they fall apart. This has happened several times. So right. About that point, I started to give up on, on the music scene. I did a couple of shows with a one more band. It was no, it was kind of a nobody band. It was called the Wise Guys, mm-hmm. and, and this is now my hair was completely grown out. I looked more like Ian Asbury meets uh, meets uh, uh, Al Jorgensen from Ministry. I grew the facial hair, the whole schmear. Was my whole Punky Meadows glam thing was gone. And I did a couple of shows did with the whiskey, did some stuff like that, and and yeah, I looked more like Al Jorgensen at that point. I had the goatee. And... I'm curious because one of the big questions that we always talk about on the show is, you know, I'm of the opinion that it wasn't so much that the audience for whatever you want to call it, glam metal, hair metal, whatever, it's not so much that they evaporated, because, I mean, Def Leppard knocked Nirvana off the charts. You know what I mean? Like, like um, Firehouse was voted Artist of the Year the same year that Smells Like Team Spirit came out. But, I, so I think the audience was still there. It wasn't so much the audience, it was more the record companies. And MTV that sort of were just like, okay, well, we don't really want to pay these bands anymore because their record company, their record contracts are coming due, and we might actually have to pay them what they're worth. So, hey, look, it's it's Seattle, and there's a bunch of kids who are trying to sound like uh, like garage band versions of the Ramones or something. So we're just gonna do that, and we're gonna call it grunge, and we're gonna push that. Like, uh, uh, in your opinion, what do you th- like? You were right in the heart of all this while it was happening. What do you think really happened with all that? Um, do you think yeah. it was organic or, or sort of engineered or kind of a combination of the two? Well, the writing was on the wall once Nirvana came out. There was there was no way Thunderball was going to exist. You know, we were one of the la- the last bastions of of bands who who were like you know in the era I grew up on. Bands were gods on stage. There was a separation between church and state. There was the audience; they looked like an audience, and the band was definitely looked like a band. And now since Seattle was coming in and it was like flannel shirts and cargo shorts and, and uh, co- uh, combat boots and greasy hair and, uh, and facial hair. And it's like, they're singing a depressing shit about, you know, about heroin and how bad life is and how depressing it is. This is the Northwest invasion. And I'm like, you know what? The writing's on the wall. We're not going to get anywhere with this anymore. And, and so 
uh, I couldn't fight it. You know, you, we could not stand up to the power of the ocean coming down. On, and and it, what what that what is now called hair metal, that the whole the thing just imploded. It, it, it when it ran its course, and I guess the labels got tired of trying to, to assign bands that were copying other bands that were copying other bands. There already was a Guns N' Roses. You're not going to sign another Guns N' Roses. Yeah. So so I guess they looked at at the Seattle scene as something that was more refreshing. It had angst, it had anger, it had you know a whole subculture attached to it. It wasn't punk, but it had the same elements of of the spirit of punk and rebellion. And every once in a while, it's going to turn itself over and eat itself. So I guess that's what was happening. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the your Pearl Jams and your Sound Gardens and this stuff was starting to come. Alice in Chains, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm hearing bits of '70s roots in bands like Alice in Chains, you know, so. It wasn't completely like I didn't hate it all, but I, I just I didn't dig the, the greasy anti rock image. Yeah, you know. I I, just... I I think the the worst thing about it was just this blanket aspersion that was cast on a bunch of bands from the eighties, whether they even sounded anything like Poison or Motley Crue or whatever, who all got lumped in with that same. They were all painted with the same brush. You know what I mean? Like, there's you can hear 70s influences and, and even 60s influences in some of those bands, but it was like, oh, you're from the 80s, not cool anymore. And yet bands like Poison were still playing arenas, stadiums right. in, in other states. Yeah. So it, I, I, can't, I, I don't know how that works. And, and in Europe, of course bands grabbed a lifeline and you know by touring germany it's yeah well europe was always a little bit behind they never got to experience the 80s when they were 80s were happening and right in the in the thick of it and now that europe is in the thick of the 80s they were the reliving the resurgence of the 80s right so you know all your big festivals your wackens and all of that uh, out there you, all your 80s bands are, there's a revival of and people are sick of 90s and they, they want their, their their comfort food back and it's all of the bands that I knew from the eighties. They're all the keel and all these guys, they're all uh, autograph. There are a lot they're playing again, right? They're not making what they used to make. It's all, you know, merchandise now and, and you know, but there's no labels. So everybody's putting out their own product, mm-hmm. crossing their fingers, doing a monsters of rock cruise and hoping for the best. Yeah. Well, and you have a unique perspective on it because you sort of, um, after the flannel plated apocalypse of the 90s, you broadened your career not only musically, but also, you know, vocationally. You got into like f- a little bit of film production here and there, from what I understand. As a history geek myself, I love hearing that you're into like military history reenactments. Um, Sa- Sabaton fans, fans oh, yeah. will love yeah. the Winged Hussars connection and the Polish yep. military history yep. stuff, which I think yep. is absolutely genius. But you you did all this stuff and then came back to music. So you're sort of the man standing outside. How drastic was the culture shock? Because the last time you were in it, yeah, it was like the 90s. But there was still a little bit of money to be made. And it was still a, hey, record an album, sell it to people. They might actually buy it situation. To now when you come back, it's a digital world. It's totally different. Well, I'm sure if he was still alive, Lemmy would have said, look, if you're if it's not fun anymore, get the hell out, which is what I did. Music wasn't fun anymore. I did not want to fold to the pressure of, of looking and dressing and being like Seattle. Right. And I got out, and I started working in the film industry, and I was making much better money. So I, I did a TV series, uh, Air America, which was based off of the, off of the, uh, the movie. But, you know, uh, Lorenzo Lamas, I worked with him from Renegade oh, and, sweet. and like that. So. Yeah, so I got to I got to you know did a series a, a season of that and and it was hard work. It was fun, but it was hard work. But I was making good money, you know. And the music scene was eventually starting to re- resurge itself while I was out. I I I did five years in the state California State Military Reserve, so it was kind of like my way of giving back. Mm-hmm. Was an active military, but I was still military. It was the lowest branch of the army. Mm-hmm. So I did that, and while I was doing that, and the film industry, I got involved in doing the Renaissance Fair thing, and became the first guy to officially represent 17th century Poland, like you said, the Wing Hussars. And I kind of introduced that to the United States, and then awesome. until other groups started to do the same thing and pick up on it, and and uh, 
we made we made U.S. history by being the first representation of the winged hussar cavalry in in uh, the New York City 2002 Pulaski Parade. That was never done before. Not only in that parade, but any parade in American history never had a winged hussar. It was the first one to do that. Very cool. You know, and I thank you. That, that so that's validated. And now and, you're and, now you're a famous uh, Sabaton song. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, Sabaton. Oddly enough, uh, uh, during the 17th century, because of the 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 uh, Inter-family rivalries between Poland and Sweden. The, the, the king of Sweden at that point also wanted to become the king of Poland, and his family was fighting him on it. This was the Vasa family. So, so you had Swedes invading Poland, trying to take over, and eventually they got their asses handed back to them. But <laughs> um, you know, but uh, you know, and the Wing Hussars kicked ass, and they were the ones. That, there was that was the army that. Uh, that saved Christian Europe from the invasion of Islam from from the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Yes. And, then here, and then here comes here comes Sabaton with with you know uh, their their uh, homages their, their homage to to Poland and Poland's gallantry and 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 uh, bravery yeah. in the song Forty to One. And then they did Wing Sars and they did they're they're like the, the other the other version of Man of War doing songs about military history and battles and whatnot like that. So yeah. I did that for about. A decade, a little over a decade. You know, I got as far as I think I could go with it, as far as representing my my ancestry and my ethnicity and wing stars. I decided to start circling back and sniffing at the the music industry again. Yeah. And it's funny how you you, you used a, a, a term you know, a few moments ago called outsider, or outside the the, the the circle. That's exactly what it became, oddly enough, because as I tried to get back in, I found it difficult. It was like somebody had circled the wagons and went, he's back, don't let him in. And I started doing, you know, jamming around with, with various, you know, uh, they weren't really big all-star jams. It was it was lower-level stuff, local band jams like that. But I'd get up and I'd play with this band, a couple of songs, that band with a couple of songs. And then Ron Keel comes back to plays The Whiskey, 2013, contacts me and said, look, I, I can't possibly come to Los Angeles without asking you if you'd be interested in coming up and doing a couple of songs and i said well yeah thank you of course i i had put on a lot of weight at that point i i had literally what looked like a basketball under my shirt double chin under double chin. you know i i had let myself go and and like that so he invited me up and we did cold day in hell and an acoustic version of serenade it was like being at the country club in 1983 all over again the, the place with the fans were like it went wild. It was nuts. Nice. So that's when Ron said, "If I you know, if I ever do a Steeler reunion, would you be interested?" I said, "Anytime, anywhere. Just say the word." I like that. And Fred Corey happened to be standing there. I didn't recognize him because he cut his hair. He says, "Hey, you know, if you ever do a Steeler reunion, I'd like to throw my hat in the ring." Ron looks at me. I look at Ron. And I'm like, this is all good stuff to keep on the back burner. Yeah. And little by little, I started to come back into trying to push my way back into. The, the local LA music scene. Crazy how this like one album band that wasn't even around that long and, and other bands that spun off from it had more success and so forth. But Steeler, just that album seems to just sort of reign eternal. Looking back on that, what do you think about like, cause that stuff, you know, hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube, those songs haven't gone away. That's funny. It's funny you should say that. The thing is, I, I, to this day, I, I run into people who say, you know what? Steelers, my, in, in the top five of my top ten stranded on a desert island with metal albums. Yeah. You know, it's like, or they say, this was, this was my introduction to, to hard rock and heavy metal. And, and this was, this was, this is a, such a cornerstone influence of so many musicians and so many bands, yeah. you know, and, and yet I can't, I can't play that legacy now in los angeles uh to my advantage because i run into the the attitude of yes yeah, so <laughs> so you're in steel so so you play with mousting so right so and that's just that's just the thing about los angeles is this it's so jaded with its head up its ass well um any anything else you want to plug before we're off here i can't thank you enough for for joining me and setting the record straight on a number of things had a blast talking to you well this started a couple of years ago and wound its way to to where it is now um I got I got approached by a guy out of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. He's got a group called Hair Nation. They do one of the eighties tributes bands. But he's also the lead singer for Carmine and Vinnie Apice's project. This guy named Jim Crane. Oh, okay. And and, and uh like drum wars and all of the, all the stuff that Carmine and Vinnie do. 
when they do their drum things. Uh, he's the singer for them. He saw me on Facebook, said, Red Fox Steeler, I wonder what he's doing these days, and contacted me. What Jim does is he puts together these albums that, that uh, he gets all these A- A-list mega fucking stars to play on his albums, just just to do guest, guest parts. Yeah. Nobody's getting really paid for this. They just come in, you know, he'll give them a song, they play a solo. He'll give them a song, they'll play a bass, something like that. I we just recorded on his latest album called uh, London Fog. Mm-hmm. And I did a track with Vinny Apathy and uh, this guy named Steph Hond. He played guitar with Paul Diano, I think, in Battle Zone. Oh, I love and, Battle Zone. And, yeah, he's, he, Steph's out of France. Phenomenal guitar player. Guys, so he's on it, Vinny Apathy's on it. And it was the single, it's called Broken. And then he's got me on a, uh, on a, a cover song by Angel, Don't Take Your Love, off of the Sinful album. Oh, okay. And and Frank Frank Domino is singing on it. Okay. So he's doing he's doing a duet with with Jim, like that. Uh, Mike Tramps on the album. Rudy Sarzo, uh, like I said, the Apathy Brothers are on it. Tony Franklin's on it. I mean, all your your biggest names in the business are, are on on this album. So you know, it was a, it was an honor to to be part of this. And I, I've I've tried to help promote Jim. Nobody knows who he is. You know, that was kind of like one of the latest things I did, at least outside of the tribute scene. This morning, I woke up to a phone call with, with a, a manager of a. Of a huge well-known band out of the 80s who asked me if I would be interested in replacing the bass player <laughs> <laughs> here it comes again um, he said he's going to talk to the to the band leaders and see how they feel about it because uh, you know I mean, you can see what I do on YouTube it's on Facebook and, right. and I'm, I'm about a high profile and, and like I said I, I bring that 80s energy back into, I mean, you know, I can't do what I did in Steeler. I'd let piss and vinegar has gone when I, I was the oldest guy in Steeler. I was 27 mm-hmm. at the time, but I, I can't, I can't do all of that now. So, so, uh, at my age, but I still bring some energy to the stage and, and people notice that. So I think that's, if they're, if they're interested and they want me in their project and they run out of everyone else and go, well, how about Rick? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> he's still around. Let's see what he's doing. But it's great. It's great that somebody has an interest and in, in, they think I can, I can bring something to help help bring. You know, it's like a shortstop. You know, you you you're the team player. You you fill the hole. You you be, you be the guy that they can rely on. So, right. You know. I believe, and I believe the word for that is journeyman. And uh, I I don't think there's okay. in terms of basis in that scene, you are certainly one of the foremost journeymen of that era. No question. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad we were able to set the record straight on certain things, get more in-depth with certain stories that haven't really been told. Like I said, especially with regard to Wasp, which is the video that, you know, we initially made contact over. Um, There's so much disinformation about the formation of Wasp and what the actual, like, nascent stages of the band were. So it was really cool to set that straight. Um, Thanks for joining me, Rick. I appreciate it. There was so... Rich, there were so many people that kept sending me that copy of your YouTube uh, thing about, about Wasp. Yeah. And they said, look, at least he's giving you credit. At least he's giving you credit. And I'd watch it, and i go, yeah, but he's got some stuff wrong. If there's any way we can contact this guy, and, and maybe he can, if he can go back and edit it and fix it, that would be great. And yeah. next thing you know, somebody somebody found a way to get in touch with you, and, and they said, here's the guy. You can contact him. And So I'm, I'm glad it took a while for, the, for, the, for us to come full circle, but... You know, to, for me to you and I like to, to make contact and and actually get set this record straight. So I, I really appreciate you know you taking the time and and, and the interest and consideration of, of of having me be able to come in there and and, and correct yeah uh, the technicalities. Yeah, absolutely, that's, that's awesome. sir. I'm much appreciated. I was I was hooked up with a singer from Goodbye. Oh my god. What the fuck is going on with that? I I have no idea. I have Jesus. No idea. Yeah. Let's uh, uh, uh Yeah. We'll we'll just power through the rest of this stuff. It's no big deal. Um just you know, I can edit around all this. It's not a big deal.